What's up, guys? Episode 9 of the Four Lifters by Lifters podcast. Uh, we have CrossFit athlete Kelly Baker here. Uh, Kelly is one of our sponsored athletes. Uh, she also has a pretty cool track record with competing. Um, do you want to give a little background on that? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I've been competing in CrossFit since 2000, I guess officially 2016, uh, but I started CrossFit in 2015. Um, and if you're familiar with CrossFit, it just has kind of changed a little bit recently in the past two ish years. Um, so they now have cut out something called regionals. Uh, so it's because that has changed in order to make it to the CrossFit games, uh, you almost have to travel a little bit more around the world. So the exposure and being able to travel has been pretty awesome. So just kind of, it's been cool to be going through the entire process as it's been changing and also, if you are familiar, things are really changing now as far as um, who owns CrossFit. <laughs> so I'm not really even sure what the next year will look like for me, but I'm excited to see. So, You think you'll, you'll compete regardless? Yeah. So for me, when I first started CrossFit, or really like any sport that I've ever done, I felt like it was always for something. Like in order to play division one college that's probably why I work so hard or because what, I trained so what did you do in college I played soccer you played soccer yeah and that yeah. was d1 yeah okay um so I almost felt like I trained so hard because I had this end goal of like being a d1 athlete and then with CrossFit it was like I trained so hard to like prove that I could make regionals or prove that I could make the games and I don't know I think after 2018 when regionals kind of ended and I also um like fell a little bit short to making games and I was like so heartbroken I felt like I deserved that I should have made games just because I put so much work in and that was such an ugly mindset to me that I had that I'll just right now I don't even care that the games got canceled for team I'm just training because I want to I have this like weird obsession with being like the best version of myself and I think that's so raw and rugged to like every day make yourself as super uncomfortable and put yourself in these like positions to see like what your potential is. Yeah. I think when we started following you, um, just one thing that really st like stood out was just your discipline. Uh, I guess I came to you from sports like athletics. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, that's like one thing I would press for most people that even right now, I tell this to a lot of my nutrition clients that almost feel a little bit lost or don't have that structure is get on something that gives you that structure. Like I feel like that's so empowering, especially for kids. Like I'm sure you grew up playing sports, but mm -hmm. I didn't get the choice of whether or not I was going to do my homework right after school. It was like, nope, I had soccer practice that night. So it was come home, eat something, uh, get your homework done, go to practice. So yeah, but I, think, I feel like my whole life has just been so regimented that it just kind of like trickled into my adult life. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have something. You know, we see it with almost everybody that competes at a high level. They competed at a high level when they were younger too. Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of used to the platform. They're used to getting beat. Uh, yeah. So when you compete at a high level in sports, like especially on team sports, you're not always going to win. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like bodybuilding or powerlifting where it's just you. Uh, so we see it a lot. And I think that that structure at an early age just makes so much sense for, for people competing at a high level later on. Yeah. It's yeah. been – that's kind of the coolest thing for me. Um, so my mom and my sister both never really did athletics. Like my sister played a little bit of sports, like field hockey here and there. And then once I got into CrossFit, I was kind of like – why don't you guys kind of hop in too? And my mom literally has never done anything athletic in her life. So now she's almost 60 years old and she lives a similar lifestyle that I do. So she's very regimented. She eats a certain way. She goes to the gym five times a week. So for me, it's been so cool to almost see, like even if you didn't grow up having that lifestyle that we've had, that you can still start like right now. Get, it doesn't even have to be CrossFit. I'm not saying bodybuilding or lifting or anything. Like, get on a running program, something that just gives you something that you know you need to do um, in a schedule. And I think that's so, like, empowering. So what's the most important, like, first step for that? Um, I think really finding something that you're going to enjoy doing. So there's too many people, like, set these huge goals. Like, you see it in January. Like, I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to do this or that. And if you enjoy going to the gym and, like, hitting sets, that's awesome. Then you'll probably be able – I say this 
the same idea with following a nutrition plan. Like if you do keto or you want to do intermittent fasting, whatever it is that you decide to do, it has to be something that you can sustain and keep up with. So if you hate running, then like I probably wouldn't recommend you like doing a marathon training program. But um, if you do, then go sign up for one. That's my biggest thing I would say is like put yourself out there. Like put yourself in a position where you're going to have to be uncomfortable. Like something that really scares you. It might for some person it might be a marathon. Someone it might be a five k if you've never run. But then then you have something at least you're working towards. And I think that's probably the biggest thing. We have a lot of kids. Uh, this used to happen a lot more when bodybuilding was, uh, I, I feel like it kind of peaked maybe a few years ago, at least at the amateur level. But guys would come in and say, uh, you know, I'm going to hire a coach and get my pro card. And the next question was, oh, great. Like, how long have you been training for? It's like, oh, I'm just getting started. Mm -hmm. it, that's to me like that's such a, an unrealistic goal. Yeah. Right. And you have no idea what even that entails. So, like, start with smaller goals, mm -hmm. right? Like, maybe go to the gym for a month and hold yourself accountable there. Yeah. And then teach yourself some some techniques and how to implement, you know, certain diets or different training protocols and see if you even like it. And yeah. then you can, like, make that lofty goal for, for a pro card or whatever it may be. Um, but I, I think it would be the same with CrossFit. If you just walk into a CrossFit gym and, you you know, you get a good vibe, you know, the mu music's going, you're having fun. You're like, yeah, I'm going to go to the games. Like, uh, well, maybe that's yeah, a little lofty. Yeah, like, yeah, like, take exactly. it a step back and see how far you, know, you can take it with these little, like, mini goals. Yeah, I think a lot of people, too, have this idea that in order for them to be to go from like the couch potato to the gym that they have to do these huge drastic things like almost these snapshots of them being excellent or like them like totally changing exactly who they are but really it's like if you just keep doing something little that's a little bit different every single day that's where you make the biggest changes because they be, if you ever read the book like atomic habits he talks about just like doing something little like an atom atomic but every single day that's just a little shift in your, like even if it goes from eating if you eat fast food five times a week and you eat it four times a week that's progress yeah. so it's going to look different for every person but it doesn't always have these grand things like I've had so many people ask me like even people that are pretty good at CrossFit, like, how do I get to be the next level? Like, how do I do it? And it's like, you have to be okay with doing the really boring shit the, for a long time and giving up things that you like. It's almost like, how much are you willing to sacrifice if you're going to make that next leap? But if you're just wanting to get in better shape or be healthier, it doesn't have to be as big of a deal as you think it is it's just changing little habits that you've created in your life or you know some people over 30 years and just being okay that it's going to need to shift do you think a lot of a lot of it is just showing up yeah totally and that's the same idea like the like the corny quotes out there like no days off like uh, you'll sleep when you die it's almost like no, like those things are a priority too. It's just like, yeah, you're not always going to want to, but if it takes like 30 days to create a habit. So if you every single day for 30 days wake up and have a glass of water every single morning, that's building a habit that's you're going to sustain. So if you just make it a thing where you're going to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and you just cr create that as a part of your lifestyle – that is like that is just showing up and you're going to see progress um like for instance I've had people like I just didn't get to the gym at all this month I just like uh, and it's like um like in my first <laughs> off in my mind I'm like a month like I get it like a day or something but for me I just feel like it's never been a choice like I've never had the option of whether I was going to go to the gym or not going to go to the gym it was just if that was a part of my schedule that day it just yeah like do I always want to no, but am I ever going to let that choice be a factor? Definitely not. I think, like, the part about showing up is you don't want to go until you're there. But once you're there, like, you, it just kicks in and, and you're ready to go. Because if, if you made the effort to go there, you're not going to half-ass your workout. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it count for something. Yeah. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a point in showing up. Yeah, I think the accountability factor, too. Like, for me, I have a coach, and so I – almost have that accountability of like a feedback like if I just told him like no this week isn't going to work out for me you know it probably wouldn't go over well but if you just get someone else to jump on board with you um, I think that that camaraderie of someone else kind of suffering it's kind of why when I went from individual to team uh, for CrossFit 
it was kind well I went from team individual back to team but that was been that was been like the coolest shift is that you just have like a group of people that know what you're going through and I kind of mentioned my mom and sister my brother does CrossFit too um that's been the coolest thing for me as well because growing up like my mom didn't really understand what my soccer practices might have been like but when I come home and I'm like I just clean and jerked you know 245 and like it was a PR or something she's just like she gets what that means to me so it's almost been this really cool bond that I've been able to like create with my family because we've all you know kind of gone through this journey together which has been really cool that's really cool when when you talk about CrossFit like your training um at a, at a high level you do have to kind of hire like an outside coach I feel like and, yeah. and you're at that point you're just kind of using the facility yeah um what's the difference between like class and what you're doing on your own yeah so class is uh so everything in CrossFit I would say you can make it as hard as you want so I've said this before to people that I think when they see CrossFit or they're looking for workouts or something, they always want something that's super sexy. Like these like intricate workouts that are like, you're doing this for a amount of time. Then all of a sudden you switch over to one rep and do this. But it's really like a lot of my training is really boring. Like I'm doing accessory work, a lift, I'm mobilizing. And then I'm doing, you know, hit two Metcons, but it's just going to be a little bit structured towards like how my competition might be. So because I'm a team athlete, a lot of us have to do really high reps and then rest, really high reps and rest. Whereas a class structure is more, you kind of go in, they stretch you, you hit a lift, hit a workout, and you leave within an hour. So I would say my training is much longer, but it's not, I wouldn't even say, I think sometimes class when I watch them, like they are, they go hard every single day because they're competing with someone. Um, whereas mine is more kind of based on what I need for that time of year. When I see like high level CrossFit athletes uh, train, it, it to me, it reminds me of an athlete training for a sport. Mm -hmm. uh, is that they're spending a lot of time on specific things. Like, I think you, you always post up pictures of you and, like, your assault bike, right? Yeah. And that's something that I think you do on the regular, right? Yeah. Uh, but in class, that might not be something that's done regularly. Yeah. So, like, you, you have certain focuses, and I think that that also allows you to, you know, track progress a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. uh, some One of the biggest things, with, uh, I guess, with, with class is that, it, it's a little chaotic, especially if you're showing up on the days that you can show Random. up. Yeah. And uh, so the intensity is great and that can always carry over to whatever results. But I think as far as like building up and, you know, building strength levels to where you're mm -hmm. at and the endurance levels to where you're at, I feel like there has to be specific programming for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the goals that people have when they walk into a CrossFit gym are going to be way different than mine. Like a lot of them just want that accountability or camaraderie or, you know, some just want to look better with in a bikini. Um, so for me, it's never been like, oh, I'm doing CrossFit because I want to look good. It's my body's a byproduct of just whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, but those people that go to class, you're completely right. Like they might, some of them don't even know what their one rep back squat is just because they maybe didn't max out on the day that we did two yeah. months ago because they didn't show up that day. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit more, I would say like not random, but it's hard for them to see big progress. Um, but I could also make the argument where for me, I'm pretty, I've been doing this for so long. I've been kind of peaked for me to see progress, it's very, it's almost maybe a little bit more difficult than someone who just shows up every single day and just oh, tries a random one rep here or there. Yeah. So kind of just kind of like a little bit different mindset. All right. So you, you said your body is a byproduct of your performance. Uh, I think that that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions with CrossFit, right? I would, yeah, probably, uh, with, yeah. With like entry with, with either people that don't do it or people that are just getting in, uh, is that they may not understand that it's a performance sport. Mm -hmm. And the better you perform um, doesn't always mean the better that you're going to look. Absolutely. But it could follow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so I always, uh, growing up and, and doing powerlifting, um, my goal was to lift as much as possible, and therefore I ate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it was. Uh, and nowadays I see a lot of powerlifters restricting their calories, and that's going to increase rates of injury. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you're also restricting the, your ability to lift more. Yeah. Uh, so for us, like if I can lift 700 pounds at 205 body weight, right? The next weight class would be 220. 
but and then 198 but if i suck down seven pounds i might squat you know 650 yeah well i don't want to squat 650 yeah. i want to squat 700 so i don't i never restricted myself to a weight class because i just found that that was silly yeah um you know luckily for crossfit there's there's no weight classes so you don't have any restrictions like that but i do feel like athletes may be restricting themselves because of uh they want to look a certain way, way to yeah. to be marketable yeah uh, no that's um i think that that has been the coolest thing for me so getting into crossfit also got me into nutrition and then that got me interested in learning more and i needed to learn more um i i laugh about it because when i first started crossfit um we used to use wadify which is uh, an app that you know you could track your progress and you would be able to put your nutrition in and i remember writing down my nutrition i don't think i had one piece of protein in my diet <sighs> like it was like um, rice cakes with peanut butter or something like that for breakfast and then for lunch it was like a salad with like I don't even know if I put chicken in it like I just was I felt because when I first started CrossFit it was for aesthetics I wanted to look a certain way um, and I remember thinking oh, but I don't want to get too bulky like I don't want big muscles I want to just like lean out or lose weight or whatever it would be uh, so stupid but um I'm so happy to be a part of this group of women that are like embodying what we can potentially look like as females and kind of like, I've, I've said this before, but I was like a sad little girl. Like I was an athlete. I grew up playing soccer. So I had a build of a soccer player and all I wanted was to look a different way. I was striving to look what I thought this like image of pretty looked like and unfortunately that image was not in my genetics i was like you know wanting to be 5 11 and and tall and skinny and blonde and um that's what i thought everyone wanted me to look like or be like and especially being a teacher it's just been so you know just awesome to be able to try to show especially like little girls like no being healthy that like i used to be so proud of myself if I like would skip a meal when I was little or like if I like could really like not eat as much as I wanted to eat because I felt like it was going to show up on a scale the next day and it was just such like a sad mindset whereas now I'm like if I'm even a tiny bit hungry or you know learning so much about the human body like I'm eating almost 400 carbs if not more when I'm like high into training um, because my body needs that and and it burns it and I lose weight that way. And it's just been, you know, I, if I could emphasize anything, um, it's that you need, like, it's unsustainable for you to eat 1200 calories or less. Yeah, you'll lose weight. Trust me, you will. But you're just going to continue going through this unhealthy relationship that you have with food. And I, I'm i sure boys have it as well. So I'm not, um, I can only speak from a girl's mindset, but in our like our society has created this idea that because girls are female and supposed to be soft or whatever category that they're putting us in is that we're supposed to act a certain way when it comes to like body image or even food in the thought process of like it's supposed to be feminine to not be hungry or to like not want to eat or to order a salad and it's just like I don't know I'm just stoked to be a part of this image that's like embracing that your body you know we should fuel it and see how strong you can get and see the potential that we have and i almost feel like it's like a new category though right totally. because when we we're younger you were either i mean you were either skinny like the, that or Arnold fat. era. yeah there was that weird era of like girls that were doing bodybuilding in the very beginning uh that was just like a whole different they were like Animal. complete outcast. Yeah, though. total outcast. Yeah. And then it was fat or really, really skinny. Um, even pregnant women, like even seeing how nutrition has shifted right now. Like my mom talks about it. Like she was like, when we got pregnant, it was a free for all. Like it was the one time in a girl's life where you were just like, I'm going to eat whatever I want and not care. And they would be so unhealthy and gain so much weight. Whereas now I have so many nutrition clients that are pregnant and tracking macros and being healthy and still doing CrossFit or doing lifting or running or um so it's just been really I feel like the emphasis on health has really increased and that's been so cool to see almost uh so I was doing diet coaching for women that do CrossFit and I do some strength co uh, coaching for men that do powerlifting 
and uh, the women almost every time we'd find their maintenance um, and then the first thing we would do is start to increase calories over time mm -hmm. and that always freaked them out because they all want to get leaner they all got leaner yeah uh, so I think the understanding the metabolism and where we are with that yeah. as a as a society as a fitness culture uh, has just helped and, and come a long way because it, it just builds a lot more confidence um, you know last year I had a girl dieting at like 1500 calories this year the same girl she's a crossfit athlete uh, I think she's at 1850 yeah right and that's a big difference yeah, that's a big right difference. so if we're yeah. looking at percentages it, it's a big difference so um you know, it's just, it, it's been a, a weird shift and I think it's been really positive. Uh, I, I don't think that there really should be any restrictions on a perfor uh, performance athlete as yeah. far as, uh, you know, obviously you want to hit your protein goals. That That's important. Uh, now, whether you run on fat or whether you run on carbohydrates or a mixture of the two, I don't think it's really that important. Mm -hmm. um, but eating to perform is a whole different mindset. Yeah. And your body may not always follow, but if your performance is increasing, like that's what really you should be caring yeah. about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would be like totally naive for to say that everyone wants to look good. Like if you f look good, feel good idea, but it's just a, it is a totally different switch. And you probably see it um, in your sport where you guys have to make a certain weight class. Like I'm sure no wrestler cares what they look like if they're making weight at a certain, you know, if it's for their sport. So it's kind of similar with CrossFit. Like my body goes through peaks and valleys depending on the time of year. And it's mostly because I can't be as 100% strict that I am my entire life. I would be unhappy. And I've always said like, I want to still be able to go out with my girlfriends and go to a winery or I want to be able to have some pizza if I want to. And yeah, you can fit those into your macros if you do. But um, there's just certain times of the year where, you know, a flexibility if you're a performance athlete is going to have to narrow down. You have to be a little more dialed in. Are you more or less strict when you're coming up to a competition? More. You're more strict? Yeah. Okay. So some people might think it might be opposite. Like, oh, because my training is so high – um, that I would be able to have a little bit more flexibility. But for me, it's like if I'm – I always, like, will say this, like, you can't, you know, outperform a bad diet. So, like, if I'm putting that much work in, in the gym or, you know, competition's coming up and it's so important to me to perform well, like, if I want to do everything that I can, like, there's going to be a lot of things that I can't control – especially when it comes to competition. Like I can't control the outcome of a workout or um, certain things. So in my mindset, I'm always thinking like, what can I control? So nutrition, sleep, hydration, all those things I can look back on and look in the mirror and be like, you did everything that you could. Um, I don't want to be like, well, maybe just because you trained a little bit harder, you like went out and got like a Sunday or something like that. Um, but I might be more likely to do that hit a training session and then go drink beers with my girlfriends if I don't have a competition, you know, coming up, something like that. I've always found like the closer to competition, uh, the more things you put on autopilot, the less things you stress. Yeah. So th for me, like it, it wasn't that I was strict on my diet, but I was super consistent with yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. eating. And I just, one more thing I, I was able to take out of the equation. And I think that stress, especially when you're a performance athlete, like you want to be able to just focus on what you mm -hmm. need to do and that's it. Mm -hmm. So anything outside of that is just a, it's a waste of energy. Yeah. And that's like one of the biggest components too, like sleep, hydration and stress. I think people undervalue. I think they're, if not just as important as what you're doing in the gym and what you're putting in your mouth. Like studies have shown so much that if you're stressed out and not sleeping, you're not going to lose fat. So if you're someone that thinks I need to wake up at three o'clock in the morning because I need to get to the gym, but you're also working until 10 stressed out and then not falling asleep till 12. You're getting three hours of sleep thinking that's beneficial to you. It's not like that's the, those little aspects are so important as well. How much do you, do you sleep? Uh, on average, probably like nine to 10 hours. Do you really? Yeah. In one shot? In so, Yeah. Like, or I'll just lay until I'm just like trying to fall asleep. But so I have like a whoop. So it tracks, um, but it's it's crazy how much – thank God I have this because there's so many times where I've been like, I think I got a pretty good sleep. And then I look and it's like I slept for like five and a half hours and I my recovery score is shit. And um, I feel like shit the next day. I know some people are like, well, I do better when I don't sleep as much. Uh, maybe nine hours is a lot for a lot of people. I, might pu I put my body <laughs> through a ton. So I'm like I know I probably need it for recovery. But if you're – 
no one performs best on four hours of sleep. No one. Like, I don't care if you think you're one of those people that are like superhero like and like, no, I do fine on four hours. Yeah, you're probably getting by, but there's so much more in the tank if you're able to, you know, get in at least eight. Um, so that's why I would say like anyone from like seven to nine, I think is like a good range. Yeah. I think that's a culture shift. Uh, we had a bodybuilder in here, I guess like episode four, maybe, maybe five. Uh, and, and he had competed throughout the nineties and early two thousands and he had a really good track record. And one of the things we talked about was just, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're in this like no sleep culture, right? Where no, everybody thinks that if you're sleeping, uh, you're not working wasting hard, time. but realistically, everybody's wasting time throughout their day. Yeah. And then they're finding that they they don't have the time to sleep and they think that they're uh, accomplishing a lot because of that uh but yeah. the biggest resetter like a lot of times guys are guys will come into the store and say you know i, I don't feel this pre-workout well, your pre-workout's 450 milligrams of <laughs> yeah. caffeine. like that's an absurd amount of caffeine yeah. and the fact that you don't feel it has nothing to do with the pre-workout yeah. and everything to do with the fact that you're not sleeping you're drinking energy drinks and coffee throughout the day mm -hmm. and you're not taking care of yourself yeah and um you know, every once in a while, you're able to convince somebody to like lay off the caffeine. And every time what happens is they start having better gym sessions, they start growing, and, uh, you know, and they start taking care of themselves. And it's just a cycle, like the less you sleep, the more caffeine you need, the more caffeine you have, the less you're sleeping, mm -hmm. and, and the worse quality sleep that you're going to have. So I, I just think it's, um, I don't know if it was Dana Lynn Bailey, I'm just going to blame her. Um, but when she did the, uh, like the onward drink that she had, and she was really promoting like that they were only uh, sleeping like four hours a day. And all of a sudden the whole fitness culture was like, listen, she's the best. So if she's able to function like that, yeah. like there's no reason that we can as well. Yeah. I just, yeah, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head where you're saying like, because social media is so big, you're trying, I feel like what we see or what's put out there, you know, we all say it like is, is a highlight reel, but you're, you're seeing like, top performance athletes and it looks like they're doing nothing but training or that's all that they're posting so it seems like that's all that they're doing all the time but um that is that couldn't be further from the truth like every high performance crossfitter that I know probably doesn't work but they they also that's part of their lifestyle is getting sleep and and taking days off like mm -hmm. I can't stress that enough that idea of not taking days off is so so dumb to me like your body needs to recover and you're going to do more harm if you train seven days a week um and I think that's kind of where the one blame I probably would put on social media is p everyone's putting out this like false advertisement of what they're doing trying to one-up someone else and you kind of said it perfectly like where there's n n not enough hours in the day to sleep. But think about how many hours you're skimming social media. Like how much time that we do you waste. You ever look at the screen time app? Like I, exactly. Like, <laughs> I'm like, thank God for that. I saw how like uh, Amazon put something and it's like hilarious, but it's, you put your phone, it's like a lockbox. So like you, once you shut it, you can't, it doesn't pop back open for like three or four hours. And it's like, you know, supposed to be for parents doing it to kids. And I'm like, no, our everyone should have to do this. People like, are gonna tweak out. Yeah, like, uh, like the amount of anxiety sometimes it gives me, like, just because I'm either comparing like someone's workout that they did and a score they got, and then I'm just like, especially if you know you're competing against exactly, them. Exactly. Yeah, and it's just like, what am I do? This is such a waste. And like, who even knows, you know, what's true or false that's even put out there. So, yeah, that's kind of like. Yeah. Exhausting. And you don't know what version of people are going to show up. Like, that's the fun yeah. part about competition. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's so many variables in it. Mm -hmm. um, when you travel, uh, I think recently you were at Paris, uh, France? I was in Paris and Ireland, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have to do anything different, like with your diet, your sleep, your uh, training? So, well, obviously, their time difference. That's always the hardest about traveling uh, to compete. But food in other countries you're just like oh my god like they don't have peanut butter like little <laughs> things like that so I've learned just to like really travel with food so like even little staples I'm just like all right if they don't have this but like always like oatmeal or um like I even brought apples last time just because in Paris there was like no lettuce or fruit that when we were I was unreal um but yeah it's been hard to find like the staples that you have consistently built up into your like routine 
in these other countries that might not sell them, you're like, oh, crap, that kind of sucks. But, uh, yeah, so that's kind of in the hardest part, I think. So you don't bother tracking uh, when you're traveling like that? You uh, just kind of do your best? Yeah, do my best. I always bring, like, a food sc- so, like, if I go to family parties, I'm not bringing a food scale. But if I'm still in training mode, I'll bring a food scale to try to weigh, like, certain things that I think are important to weigh. Uh, like, if I am having peanut butter, I try not to guesstimate things like that. That will be really high in fat. Um, but, yeah, for the most part, when we're competing and if I'm somewhere else like that, it's just, like, I just want to make sure I feel good. And, yeah. When uh, when you're coaching people through Black Iron, um, are you coaching them for performance uh, through their diet or are you coaching them for aesthetics? Uh, so they can choose a different, any route that they want to go on. So when they first sign up, they can say they want to do it for performance. They're on here for fat loss. They're on here for weight gain. Um, you know, they're on here just because they want to have a better relationship with food. So they might've come from a certain program that was really restrictive and then they've yo-yo dieted and then they really have a hard time even trusting anything. Uh, so there would be like a more of a lifestyle. So I have like, it's been really cool. I have some really high performance CrossFit athletes and I also have like a 75 year old mother who like grandmother who just wants to feel good and like be healthy. And she kind of started during this whole coronavirus, um, just realizing like I need to kind of kick it into gear. Like I'm not healthy. And, um, so my approach with the high performance athlete is you need to be within five grams of your macros, what I subscribe you and hit this protein post-workout and then for someone like her i'm like we we might not even track macros we're just learning like food concepts yeah things about nutrition or things that she can incorporate or do like we kind of talked about before little habits that she can start incorporating so hers might be uh that we actually add water to her diet like she didn't drink any water she just drank pepsi so for her a win is you know drinking a glass of water in the morning or and one before bed something like that so with your performance athletes uh you're not allowing them like an intense workout like they can't kind of have like a little free-for-all with food oh no no so yeah i would give refeed days or things like that um i don't personally believe in like cheat days and i just the only reason why I say things like that is I don't like the stigma that people put on certain foods. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to eat chicken, rice, broccoli every single day. But like a Saturday comes around, it's my cheat day. So I have like, and it's just like a whole day the is surplus ridiculous. of like calories that people can eat in a day. Like I have so many girls, especially that will say like, I'm eating 2,100 calories. That's way too much. Of that. And I'm like, track Saturday. So you told me that you weren't tracking Saturday. Go just go into the app and guesstimate what how many calories you ate on Saturday, and they they'll be nearly forty five hundred calories, like with alcohol, with brunch that they did, with p- late night pizza, and then a bag of pretzels and this. And it's like because you didn't track it, it's like it's so mind boggling. Like so, I just kind of like the idea of incorporate those things that if you do like them, like if you want Oreos and it's Wednesday, then have a few Oreos, like. Trying to get out of that mindset that there's good food. Of course, some are more nutrient dense, but that's where I feel like that whole yo-yo or like not seeing progress is because if you're off two days a week, that's five of seven. I don't know what percentage that is as like if you were scoring on a test, but it's probably like 60 percent. Like you're almost failing right now. I always tell people like, you know, if you eat four meals a day, it's 28 meals a week two of them like you know do your thing yeah yeah you know, i'm talking like average shows yeah uh enjoy you know life but the other ones you should be relatively structured and you should have a plan and you should be able to stick to that plan and i think it's just about scheduling yeah totally totally so you're uh you're okay with processed foods being built into diets i am yeah yeah uh i do like an 80 20 rule so me personally i probably only have like two days where i really have like processed foods like if I wanted an Oreo or something like that, or I'm like at a family party and my mom makes something like dirt cake or something, I want to have a piece of it. Um, But like I said, it's like 80% of my diet is totally nutrient dense. And then I allow flexibility for 20. And I just found for me that like, if I'm so restrictive all week long, the minute that I have something that I'm like, this is considered bad. I've already like, gone over and now I'm not being perfect or something like that of the idea that that's where I would see myself have a domino effect um so for some people it might just be different some people could just eat clean all this and all the time but 
um, yeah, for me, it just like wouldn't work. Yeah. For me personally, uh, I, I don't mind processed food, but I go by digestion. Yeah. So if I yeah. don't digest a, a food, uh, and the more processed it is, typically the worse I digest it. Uh, so if I don't digest something well, I just don't need it. Yeah. And uh, that that in itself keeps me away from it. But I feel like we, um, you know, you're talking about your girls on Saturday night. They go out and they, they eat and they have an entire cheat day. Uh, I feel like we have a, a weird culture within fitness that glorifies like over the top food. Right. You can't just have a cheeseburger. It's got to yeah, be like, like this caramel <laughs> drip, yeah. like, you know, and have all this stuff on it. It has to be a foot high. Bacon. Yeah. yeah. And it has to look really cool for Instagram. Yeah. But like, I feel like if we could just moderate that yeah, down a little yeah. bit, we could have those foods more frequently. There's yeah. nothing wrong with the cheeseburger. Yeah. Like it, it, carbohydrates, a little bit of fat. Most of it cooks off on the grill. You're getting some cheese on there ultimately you know it's not that bad yeah but when you put all that other stuff on Things, there and you're getting yeah. the the most loaded thing from red robin with the endless fries and mm-hmm. then the, the milkshake and all this other stuff it's just way over the top so for me like the balance is just not being extra when mm-hmm. i when i eat all that yeah stuff. and i think it more comes with that same idea like the whole cheat day it's like if i'm gonna do it i gotta like i can't just have a cookie i have to go to like that you know, crazy cookie place that has a cake on top of the cookie. (laughs) And you're just like, what? Like that, that's why I kind of like the idea of being able, if if you want to track it and then move on, like have that fixed so that when it does come to the time where you're like, you might be able to say no to the cake with the cookie on top because you had it on Wednesday, you had a couple Oreos and you're not like, Oh, I never get this. Like it's like a binge response. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Are you capable of coaching people through different like diet, ideologies yeah so black iron nutrition is mostly macro based um that's kind of what our software is set up but i've always been the component of like if you can sustain it long term i am on board with whatever you want like my dad does mostly keto um now again like if it's a sunday maybe he'll have like a pasta if our family kind of throws it together but like for the majority and it's worked for him because he just doesn't have it's not in his lifestyle to weigh and measure and he's on the go all the time. So he needs something that's going to work for him and his lifestyle and how he can do it longevity. Um, where I think some, uh, you know, nutrition coaches think it's like one way fits all. And that's, you know, that's such a horrible approach because your lifestyle is going to be so different than someone else. And I kind of said it too, like, I have some clients that don't track anything. They just kind of go by a little bit of like a, what a typical day should look like. In my mind, I think everyone has a goal. So if your goal is to lose weight, how we get there, I don't care how we get there. If, if we're getting there tracking macros, if we're getting there because you're intermittent fasting and it's working for you and you're not going to gain it all back in one month, I, I think that's awesome. Um, Do you see that with intermittent fasting? No, no, no. I'm more oh. so just saying, like, in general, like, if you're doing keto and you lose, you do the 30-day challenge and lose 20 pounds, but then you go right back to your normal lifestyle and gain it back in two months, like, that's not a, that diet didn't work for you. Right. So it worked for 30 days, but in the grand scheme of things, that is not the diet for you because you can't sustain that long term. Um, of course, I'm biased, and I think macro base is the best just because you Are, can. They're not exclusive of each other, though. What? Like you can follow macros and still be oh, on keto. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm more so saying the whole approach of cutting out like carbs or something like that. So maybe where it's like you can eat as much as you want. So it would be like my dad's approach. Like he eats as much meats without tracking anything. Um, it works for him. But if you're only doing that or like a whole 30 where you're eating as much as you want, but then you're going to go right back um, to the lifestyle that you were living before, it, that really wasn't going to work for you. So. Yeah, I agree. Kind of what I was... So, uh, I'm sorry, I, I cut you off earlier. You've been to Paris. You said you were in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, where else have you traveled to? Uh, so, that was only places outside the country, but we've been to California, like Conne- closer places like Connecticut. We go to Miami every year, which has been really awesome. For Wadapalooza? Yeah, yeah, which is, if anyone has like a competition to go to, that's definitely the coolest one. I love Miami. Uh, yeah, I love Miami. Yeah. So many people are like, well, why don't you do a different, co-? I'm like, absolutely not. Miami is yeah, awesome. You clearly haven't been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll go like every month if they allow it. Yeah. So CrossFit has given me so many opportunities to see the world, but even more so just like the amount of people that you connect with, some of my best friends are from all over the world um 
one girl that I actually learned CrossFit through or like heard about it through, uh, we, we coached Penn soccer camps together and she was, you know, doing CrossFit at the time she had just graduated and I was still training for soccer. And she was like, do you want to go to the gym with me? I'm doing this thing called CrossFit. I was like, sure. And then I go and I could barely do like, she had like kipping pull-ups or something. And like, she, like she has a video of me trying to do mm. one. I like couldn't. And like fast forward, like now uh, she's a games athlete. And so it's just something that we've like come Very full cool. circle. And now like, I haven't seen her since that camp. She went to Marshall, but um, that was probably five years ago. I haven't seen her and we still talk like once a month. So just like, I've lived with certain people just because of the time. My teammates are from all over the world. You know, uh, the Brooke lives in Florida. Dex is right now in Texas. Well, and move, moving back to Kentucky. And then Christian is in New York. My coach is in Connecticut. So just like meeting these people that are so like-minded and very different than the people that I have grown up with. So I appreciate that group of friends that, you know, I've, went to elementary high school with they're my best friends but then I have this other group of people that know a completely different side of me um that's been so cool to like just see that you know have that in my corner as well who's the most impressive athlete that you've come across oh that's tough that I've like competed with or just seen just seen uh <sighs> So I've, I've been fortunate enough to be at big competitions with girls that have, like, won the games or something. But I think Tia would be the top. Like, you know, she's won the games three years in a row. Or Frazier. They're just, like, they're another breed. And they're the epitome of discipline. And I think what they do, they're not flashy on social media. They are just hard workers. They're grunt workers. And... They just are complete winners. They just remind me of like these animals that just like are raw and rugged and are so confident and they train together. And I think it's just really cool that they have that dynamic too. But yeah, they are so impressive. You're, you're at a pretty high level, right? So you're regionals. You haven't been to the games yet. Uh, I have for team. For so team. this year I would have been to the games for team again, but they just cut it. Yeah. Okay. So I always feel like there's like when you get to your level and then that very top where people yeah, win. There's different tiers. Yeah, there, there's multiple tiers. Definitely. How many tiers away do you think somebody like that is from you? Oh, she's another. <laughs> she's way more levels than me. Um, I think it's. So I would say like regional athletes. So in twenty to take it back a little bit in twenty seventeen I went individual and I only started in twenty fifteen, so. In 2016, went team. We made it to the games. I was still so new. And then we split up. And I was like, I guess I'll give this individual thing a shot and see what happens. And my goal was just to make regionals. And I made it. And top five make it to the games. And I ended up seventh that year. And I was just so bummed at myself because I went into regionals. Like, I uh, no matter what the outcome, like, I was almost just, like, timid. I remember, like, even that first event, like, looking around being like, should I slow down a little bit? Like, uh, I'm not supposed to be here. Like, almost feeling like I was holding myself back because I put all these girls in such a higher caliber than I was. So in 2018, I, I gave everything I had. I was more confident than ever. I was the fittest I'd ever been. I gave up. I sacrificed everything and that was where I said that ugly mindset of like I felt like I was owed to make games and I peaked too early and I went to regionals that year exhausted and you could tell and you know the workouts maybe didn't fall in my favor but I ended up 13th and I was like I was done like I was like I'm so over the I gave up everything and to not have the outcome that I saw um that I hated that about myself now I look back like I, I want to just be doing this because I'm a competitor and I love to train and give it my all every single day, no matter what the outcome is. Um, but those, those girls that are next level, this is their livelihood. So they're, they don't have other jobs. So I would like to see what I could potentially do if I could have that same luxury or lifestyle. Um, but they are just complete different machines. So I would say like a regionals athlete, and then, like, the end of the games, like, you know, 40th place or something like that, 
and then it's like that 20th place and then it's 10 and then if you're a top five you're just that's a you're whole different calorie free. yeah yeah you live eat sleep breathe crossfit you have to so with uh with powerlifting and bodybuilding certain body types tend to be favorable yeah uh so for men that deadlift they that deadlift well they typically have very long arms for guys that bench press well they have short arms mm -hmm. right uh and then squat can go on a, a bunch of different leverages uh but bodybuilding uh has become a shorter man's sport because of how much muscle they can put on their frame mm -hmm. uh so typically the the real big guys are 260 280 pounds they're five eight you know you think that they're a lot bigger because they're all standing on stage by themselves but they're typically pretty short yeah. uh and it's not to say there aren't taller guys of course there are um do you have like genetic body types that tend to be favorable for CrossFit? Yeah, usually the shorter the better. Really? Yeah, most of the movements are, you know, ground to overhead or um, handstand push ups or things uh, where you almost want shorter arms. There's maybe three or four movements that cater to like a bigger guy, like wall balls, so you're closer to the target. Um, Running would help too, right? Yeah, yeah. Long Although you could be like a little, little uh, sprinter or something like yeah. that if you're a smaller guy, but. Uh, rowing would also favor a tall guy but it's the the running joke that like every guy that you look out in the crossfit gym is like five five uh where you see like fikowski or something like that he is like maybe six foot six and he looks like an absolute freak giant like most of them are you know five five to five eight or five nine and I it's done CrossFit. Like, and would you would have been right you're, i was like you're a perfect build for it uh yeah the, it's definitely a shorter person uh you know, even like chest to bar pull ups, I mean, you want shorter arms, so your range of motion You're also is also lighter, right? Yeah. So I think the body weight aspect of it can be really beneficial. Yeah, definitely. So, one thing that we touched on earlier was the recovery aspect. Uh, so, we talked about sleep, nutrition. Um, what else are you doing for recovery to, to compete at a high level? Um, so I think treatment on your body is so important too, like my joints and uh, so I get acupuncture once or right now twice a week. I get body work once a week and then I get a deep tissue ma a massage once a month and then I take Epsom salt bath. So like staying healthy, just like most sports, is almost just as important as what you're doing in training. Um, but that nutrition side of it as well, like I'm not the big – like I mean I take supplements, but um, like – post-workout or intra-carbs things like that that I'm adding in are so important to just keep me going like I have protein and intra-carb while I train right after I train I'm having a protein and a ton of carbs um, so I think that meal timing uh, centered around your workout is so important as well for recovery um, I personally find that carbs are for me even just as if not more important than protein for my recovery um and that's kind of where it comes in with people you know cutting calories or cutting for aesthetics like if you're taking away that like you're most likely going to get injured um and that was something that happened to me I would say like when I first started out where I wasn't eating enough I was so fatigued or I was get like having tweaks or nits and crannies and I was realizing it's because my body's not recovering at all so that would be yeah I've always found that if uh like let's say we have a like a heavy leg session or something and uh your body for days afterwards might be a little bit tight uh if you don't properly recover from that then you may be out of position when because your body's still tight mm -hmm. uh you may be out of position when you go to do it again and when you're out of position it increases your risk of injury absolutely yeah. and so if you take care of yourself and you try to mobilize yourself and you try to you know whether it's powerlifting cross it doesn't matter when you try to treat yourself like an athlete you'll make sure that you're in the right positions to perform at your highest level yeah uh i saw that you you do ramad mm -hmm. are you big on that yeah so i i do it as well for like a mental aspect so um maybe like two years ago or a year and a half ago, I did a marathon and I just found that like having the one discovery that I had, not that I, I don't know if I'll ever do one again, but that time like alone in your head where you're like at peace, I never get that when I train. Like I am always so dialed into like whatever that work is that I need to get done or how I'm going to go about a workout that I never had like a mental relief. And it wasn't until I did marathon training where you're spending hours by yourself in your head monotonously moving that I was like getting this weird clarity of like who I wanted to be or what my goals might be. So as much as Ron, what I think is great because I'm getting range of motion and I'm 
you know, staying loose. Um, I do it like usually right when I get up in the morning and it's as much for a mental clarity than it is as it is for like a physical. Um, and I think that's kind of important too, like keeping yourself centered and balanced. Ramad took me from, I had two herniated discs and a bulging disc and they were all in a row in my lower back and, uh, they wanted to do surgery and give me shots and all that stuff. Uh, and I started stretching and doing Ramwad because I was dropped into a, a CrossFit class and the one day that's what the class was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Yoga, yoga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, I, I couldn't do any of the stretches. And, uh, so I, I downloaded the app and I started doing it and, uh, it, it put me in the right position to be able to squat again. And that in itself just taught me so much about my yeah, body yeah. and recovery and, and just, um, and how important it is to be in the exact right position for, for me, for strength. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm a big fan of Ramad. I think it helps a lot. It's just very tough to do if you're sore. Yeah. I don't know if you ever if you follow David Goggins or read any of his books or I know a little bit about uh, him. So he is like my God. Anything he says is scripture. Uh, he's just like raw and rugged, total my type of guy. He was super overweight and then ended up like changing his life later on and became a SEAL and an Army Ranger and you know he's done. Uh, ultra marathons he has you know done everything um but he got really hurt and it's not and he the doctors all couldn't figure out what was wrong with him and you know he talks about in you know his audio book if you anyone wants to listen to it but that stretching saved his life and it's like that same idea like no days off oh, uh, stretching is so important and I think that like is very undervalued or that similar idea where it's not sexy because you're not running your head through a wall um but it's just as important so yeah Ramwad has been you know and they're one of our sponsors too and they've been you know awesome to us but even more so their programming I think is great you can tell like just looking in the gym uh, at least a normal gym like you can tell who's stiff yeah and oh, and yeah. you know that their range of motion uh won't be the same as somebody who actively you know works on on that yeah so I think it makes a big uh, a big difference um so what's uh the you said your your next competition was canceled what? so the games the CrossFit games for teams was canceled but uh the biggest name in CrossFit is Rich Froning and he kind of has control of everything but he recently switched to teams so when that got canceled he was like I'll just throw my own big competition so there's 12 teams uh at the end of this month and we're competing in Cookville Tennessee uh so it'll be really cool yeah we're really excited it'll be probably the coolest competition I've done yeah it sounds almost uh, like a smaller version of what The Rock's trying to do. With, yeah, uh, the Titan you know, having, Gates. Yeah, well. It's actually now becoming like all CrossFit athletes. Like I'm seeing like a million of them on the Titan Games, but yeah, I don't know. I think CrossFit athletes are the most marketable. Yeah. Right? They can do everything, and they also look the part. Like yeah. Strongman at the end of the day is probably the coolest sport Yeah, as far as like functional fitness really cool. goes. Yeah. Like they do just some absolutely insane stuff, and those guys are massive. Um, but they, they don't look the part because their body so, fat's yeah. higher yeah yeah, yeah they, they yeah. don't have you know yeah. six-pack abs and yeah. and when they did uh i don't know if you remember uh marius pujanowski uh do you ever watch strongman your kid well like if it was on tv or something i would be able to watch like, certain things but i don't i wasn't like having but, posters of them in my room yeah or but, but, <laughs> so me neither but there was one guy and there was only one guy and he looked like a bodybuilder and he would do all the everything better than everybody else. And to me, like that's what blew Strongman up was just the one guy that looked really good yeah, and could yeah. still outperform everybody and else. Could sell it. Yeah. His, his biggest downfall was I think he was like a few inches shorter than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And when you're doing stuff that requires height, you know, obviously it's some some shortfalls. But uh, so uh, you're competing at the end of the the month here. If our if our following wants to follow you and to watch you compete and, you know, follow your journey, where would they go? Uh, probably just through Instagram. That's kind of all I use. Yeah. You're not on TikTok and no. all that stuff? No. Oh, <laughs> God. No, I said this, like, my biggest fear is, like, we're going to, when the bars open up, that, like, a song's going to come on and everyone's going to be doing their dance. Or it's like, it makes me cringe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm not on TikTok. What's, uh, what's your handle for Instagram? Uh, Kelbaker928. All right. Cool. Guys, uh, if you want to follow Kelly and see how she does this upcoming month, uh, give her a follow on Instagram. And uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me.